All right, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series. Uh, this is the Tuesday night edition. Our topic is anterior segment cases, enough pearls to make a necklace. And our speaker tonight is Dr. Greg Caldwell. Greg is a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Eye Institute in Philadelphia. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, and a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and the member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutrition Society. He currently works in Duncansville, PA, as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is diagnosis and management of anterior segment and posterior segment diseases, and he's been a participant in multiple FDA clinical uh, investigations and trials. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care, and thus really practices integrative optometry. He's a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of a wonderful resource called OCT Connect on Facebook. He's lectured extensively throughout the U.S. and over 13 countries internationally. In 2010, he served as president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016, and he's president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, please give a nice virtual round of applause to Dr. Greg Caldwell as we go through some anterior segment issues. Thanks, Joe. And scrolling through, I see we have friends from Canada here. Um, I see we have someone from Spain, so that was bad of me to put what state. I welcome the international colleagues that are here and all the people that are from the state. So, Joe, thanks for that nice introduction. Uh, we're going to do uh, my disclosures here and the content and the activity. Uh, the content of this uh, presentation was independently prepared by me. You can see the laundry list of people there that I've lectured for in advisory boards. Uh, I think you've heard me say that. I don't put that up there to impress everyone. Uh, here's a guy from Duncansville, Pennsylvania in a 5OD practice, and I love doing education. And I really interact with these companies to make sure that the finger is on the pulse to be able to deliver you what is coming out there and how to apply it uh, in the clinic. Um, there's really no financial proprietary interest. I do have a non-salaried financial affiliation with Pharmanex, but that really won't come into play tonight. Uh, PA medical director for involved, uh, chairman of a AMD and diabetes. I got to update that for the healthcare registries, but really here's, you're going to see it on the next slide. The content and format of this course is presented without any commercial bias. And I don't claim any superior superiority over any products. And I think you guys figured out Joe and I are the co-owners of Optometric Education Consultant. Uh, the, tonight, you're going to see a lot of videos, a lot of anterior segment. Um, uh, and really, I wanted to put this in here because I'll get a ton of people asking. So just get it out of the way of disclosures because I have no financial interest. In the Firefly by Efficient, um, again, down at the bottom, it says the content and the format of this is presented without any commercial bias. And then I do use uh, OptiView or now Visionics, the OCT. You're going to be seeing those tonight. I usually get those questions. So that just saves on some emails. Again, use whatever equipment that you would like for uh, your office. With that being said, we're going to start off with this. It's kind of a carryover from where we started a couple, uh, maybe weeks ago or maybe last week when Joe and I were discussing. You know, this is a 92-year-old woman, one day post-op for cataract extraction, and her pressures, I use the aura in the, in the office, the ocular response analyzer, so that's why you see 11.2 and 14.3 at 11.43. But my point is, is that she comes in and she has all this cornea edema right here in her, you know, in, obviously in her cornea. But, you know, sometimes when you see this, and this was a pearl that I was giving out, if the whole cornea is, in, if you want to say smoked or edematous, yeah. it's usually the patient had a high pressure. Maybe you can burp a paracentesis to bring that down, um, which reminds me, I could have put that in here and I didn't tonight. Um, but, you know, the key here, if you look closely, what I was trying to show, if you look over here, I drew in this circle, the, the edema is right here. And so this pressure in this patient's eye uh, is 14. 
And you'd think it would be maybe 34, but why, you know, what with all this edema? So if you look and how this edema ends up this way is that when the surgeon is phacoing, sometimes they, when the pupils dilated, they'll bring that lens up closer to the endothelial cells and phaco in the anterior chamber. And that energy just gets condensed to right here. And, you know, you know, I call it phaco edema. So it's really not that the, the reason this cornea is, is swollen like this, you can just kind of see it's in this little localized area. That's where they, in a sense, phacoed that lens and you get that edema. So a lot of times they used to say, oh, geez, here we go. I got a pressure of 40. Look how smoked this cornea is. And sometimes you get fooled, but, you know, you just kind of figure that out by going in, in the surgery. So we were talking about, you know, that I guess if I play this video again, you're going to see a lot of video tonight. Um, you can see here that it's really not edematous out here in this periphery. As you see, you can go across using you know, retro illumination. You can see where the swelling is. It's kind of this more circular pattern. You can see the folds and decimase membrane. And there's another good shot of the edema right there and how it's just kind of this round area. And that's just what, you know, from the FACO procedure that's out there. But that procedure, that, that discussion came about with Joe talking then saying about how he has seen these milkweed keratitis. And Joe was nice enough to send us a couple of those photos and I put them into this, into this, uh, into this lecture. So Joe, you wanna talk about this edema and this milkweed keratitis? Yeah, milk, milkweed is obviously by the name, a weed. And that is what the monarch caterpillars who turn into monarch butterflies uh, become. They feed on it, and what people, many people don't realize, are monarch monarch butterflies are poisonous. I mean, not venomous like a snake, but if something ate it, it will get sick, and that's why they're colored the way they are. And they get it by eating this weed. Well, this actually causes a very, very distinct type of keratitis. It will cause massive corneal edema. It'll cause folds and decimase membrane. These are people that are handling uh, handling uh, the milkweed, and I've, I've got milkweed in my property. I'm very careful about it because we uh, we try to encourage butterflies, but the epithelium is fine, and they may be a little bit uncomfortable, but they really get pretty wonky about their vision because their vision really drops down quite a bit. You know, 2060, maybe as far down as uh, as 20, 2100, uh, maybe 2200. And uh, people are just not, just not aware of it. Perfectly clear epithelium, usually a clear epithelium, but stromal edema and folds and decimates. And it's really easy to treat if you know what it is, steroid. You know, any, any good steroid for a few days is going to help things out quite a bit. And give an example, my, my wife, who's in practice with me, she came home one day and I wasn't there. That It was a day I, don't, I was in the office and she came home and she was telling me about this weird patient who had, you know, this endotheliopathy and she thought it might have been herpes, put the patient on valcyclovir, the resident uh, was there. And I said, call the patient and ask her if she's a lepidopteryx. He goes, what? I said, just call her and ask her, does she do butterflies? And my, my wife called her at home, said, oh, yeah, I, I, was, I was pulling out my old mil milkweed and putting new milkweed in, and, and this all happened. Well, there it is, milkweed keratitis. Personally, I think it's, it, where I am, it's a more existential threat than global warming right now. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, you mentioned, you know, about, you know, how the vision goes down. And one of the pearls I like pointing out, you know, when I do lectures is that, you know, it doesn't take much of the cornea to create a problem. And really, I like, you know, or decrease in acuity. And the reason being, if you guys think about it, is uh, the cornea uh, on the average K is about 43, 44. We all know that. We see Ks all the time. We fit contact lenses. And, uh, but if you think about the total diopter power of the eye, it's 60, right? That we were taught that it was 60. So 40 over 60, two thirds of the power. So it doesn't take much of that cornea swelling or cornea mm -hmm. unhappiness to really drop it since it's two thirds of the power of the eye. Remember 44 over 60, uh, it's gonna be about 67 or 68%. So again, it doesn't so, take much swelling like this to decrease that vision. So my, 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 big, my big pearl, 
if you have endotheliopathy, folds and desmase, and everything else looks good, ask about the plants. Good pearl, good pearl. Here's a 25-year-old man uh, with a painful right eye. He was welding at work last evening. He believes he has welder's flash. His eye is watery, it's light sensitive, and it's just watering and painful mm -hmm. all the time. So this happens quite a bit out in my way, you know, I say quite a bit, maybe once every, you know, six or eight oh, weeks, wow. I guess, depending on whether it's welding season, you know, they, the welders in a sense, they put the mask on, but it gets dark and they have to kind of strike the, you know, the welder to kind of get it lit. Um, now they have these masks that as soon as it strikes the mask get dark, but sometimes the, 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 the employee doesn't have that and they kind of peek around and they strike it and this intense ultraviolet light comes off and it basically gives them a nice little suntan to the front of the cornea. And you can see here that this is exactly what happened to, to this gentleman. Um, he was peeking around his, you know, his arc shield. And basically, uh, you can see all the staining that's going on uh, in the one eye, because usually they, they kind of peek with the one eye or close the one eye to kind of see what's going on. And then they just kind of intensely suntan the front of this eye. You know, so I don't get too concerned with these. Um, they're usually pretty superficial. Uh, that's out there. You could see, you know, here's the treatment uh, with, you know, I usually do generic Maxitrol, um, you know, Dr. Tolan, and it still kind of rings true after being not at the school for 27 years. He used to say Maxitrol for all, and I kind of still hear that in my head. Um, and so we use Maxitrol on this patient, and, uh, uh, and you can see how he healed up uh, and basically a day or two that, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I, I have here any concerns, any treatment, you know, what's the treatment, you know, you can cover it with an antibiotic. Um, that's really not my mainstay here. You do have some open wounds on this cornea. So you can guess, you know, medical legally, you want to cover it, but they just barbecued in a sense, ultraviolet, the front of their eye. You know, I don't think there was, it's not a, like getting a piece of dirt in their eye. So we, just hit it with the steroids pretty heavily. And you can see here, uh, this, this cleans this up. So again, any of these cases as we go through, please utilize the chat box with any questions, any concerns. I'm gonna try and hit a you know, potpourri of, 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 of conditions here tonight. So that's really just kind of welder's flash that you know, we see out here kind of in the rural part of Pennsylvania. You know, Greg, I uh, I recall Joe Tolan used to refer to Maxitrol as holy water. Yeah, it's, you know, it's I never heard him say that, but I wouldn't surprise me to hear him say that. So, um, so with that, oh, do you prefer drops or ointment for the Maxitrol? Good question, Joe. And uh, I usually use drops on this one. Here, you know, it heals pretty quickly. Um, you know, usually what really helps them out the most is just getting that preparacane in their eye. Uh, whenever they come in. Um, and then I, I guess I didn't really put in here about the treatment, you know, Maxitrol four times a day. And I usually tell them to take two and two, two Tylenol, two ibuprofen. And that really will help out with the pain, all four pills at the same time. Um, if in, and if you take four ibuprofen and two Tylenol, um, that's been shown to get to the threshold of morphine. Doesn't stay up there as long as morphine, but now you don't have the opioid issues, but two and two will do just fine. So two and two with Tylenol uh, or two Tylenol, two ibuprofen and Maxitrol drops. That's great. Um, no, no bandage contact lens really needed on this one. It heals really, really quickly uh, that's out there. Um, you'll see that there's some other conditions here tonight. I'll use a bandage contact lens. I'm not saying that it's wrong, but these heal extremely quick, um, uh, where I haven't seen a bandage out there in a ton of pain. Um, cause really I don't follow these up. I asked this guy to come back for this because I said, I do a lot of lecturing because, you know, by the next day they're feeling great. They're working. They don't want to come in and take another day off or pay another $30 copay. Uh, pro care would be another good idea. Um, maybe if it wouldn't heal, maybe after a while, maybe if the patient had maybe some EBMD or some other cornea disease and they got flashed and you wanted to use a, an amniotic membrane or a Procara, I think that would be a good, but in the welder's flashes that I see, 
Um, typically, they heal pretty quickly out there. Joe, have you do you get Wilder's Flash or have you seen Wilder's Flash? And you have any thoughts? I've seen Wilder's Flash, and I agree with everything you say here. I'm just going to extend the the, uh, the the conversation a little bit to your general. Um, can say general keratitis that they come in, they have a lot of discomfort. However, however, it happened. I do use a bandage contact lens on those because I know once the preparacane wears off, they're going to be in pain. And when we have patients with corneal abrasions, uh, keratitis, what differentiates us from the ER and the, the urgent care center is we'll put a we'll put a bandage contact lens on. And that is huge for the for the patients. That keeps them comfortable overnight. And I see somebody somebody wrote in here that urgent care centers sometimes provide a, a tetracaine bottle for use. And I think we all agree that could that could end very badly for a patient. Uh, I, I guess that's that's what they're willing to do that we're not willing to do. And what we can do that they won't do or can't do is yeah, we'll we'll use those bandaged membrane on those abrasions and significant keratitises, non-infectious keratitises. And can your, you know, Tobradex, Maxitrol, whichever one you want to use, right? Um, one Zolic. antibiotic, one, one, one steroid or, you know, two antibiotics, you know, whichever mm -hmm. one is going to be cheaper. They're both generic. I don't have a preference. If you want to do Tobradex, yeah, that's a great, you know, obviously we're going to check for allergies uh, with these patients. Perfect. All right. One more. Let's see. Uh, new, is there a problem using bandage contact lenses with max control? You know, that's a great question. I use bandage contact lenses all the time with, uh, uh, with, um, keratitis. Now, again, this one here, um, they, that's why I point out that they, uh, uh, that, that the patient, uh, had a UV light, not really anything dirty. And they pretty much barbecued and killed all the pathological, which is if there's any in their eye, um, cause it really nothing got in there either in light and then the normal flora. So a bandage contact lens and Maxitrol, I don't really have an issue with, I'm going to follow them, uh, closely, um, in a case where I'm going to just do Maxitrol or Tobradex and say, Hey, this is going to heal up. I've seen these before. You know, sometimes I don't even do the follow-up, but if I put a bandage contact lens on, then obviously I'm going to follow them and check them closely. Joe, do you have any problems with the steroid? Yeah, no. I mean, you, you said it well. It, it, it's a clean injury. I think what people worry about is the the contact lens wear progressing onto an infectious keratitis. That's generally the person who brings in their own contact lens, which is not properly disinfected, which has a biofilm on it and probably something hanging on. But when you're you're peeling off a, a fresh uh, extended wear contact lens to put on overnight. That's clean as heck. And this is a clean wound. It's not like we're, you know, the person got, got serrated by a, a blade of grass or a tree branch. I don't have any uh, issues with it because as I've always said, antibiotics are pesticides. They kill bugs. They don't make eyes better. Steroids uh, help, help make eyes better. I think there's a question, does Maxwell have BAK in it? I'm going to say probably. Yeah. I don't know for sure, but I'd say probably. Yeah. And that's actually a benefit in this case. <laughs> You're going to use that. It's going to, I know it tears up the cornea, but we're not using it in a dry eye case here. Uh, so it's going to actually help if there's any bad bugs on there too. So I'm, I'm okay with BAK, just I don't want to be doing it um, for a dry eye patient. Great questions. All right. You guys are using the chat box is how I wanted to tonight. Any other questions or anything rolling in here? I'm going to just give it a second before jumping into the next case. I, I think we're clean. Okay. All right. This one is a 30-year-old right eye welder's flash. I have welder's flash in the past, and this one's lasting a little bit longer than usual. Used multiple tears and drops, and a coworker had those numbing drops, probably from the urgent care center uh, that someone gave to him. And it makes it feel better, but when it wears off, my eye still hurts. Coworker used a magnifying glass and a magnet, and it still doesn't feel any better. They thought if there was a piece of metal in there that the magnet would pull it out um, and the magnifying glass. But this 30-year-old listened to his mom. His mom said, why don't you go to the eye doctor? Finally, he went to the eye doctor 
And I'm going to play the video here. And mom was right. You're going to see on the cornea this nice red eye. I'm going to play around with the magnification here. Sorry. You're going to see right here a foreign body. But the reason why I took the picture and put it here, there's not just one foreign body. There's two. So mom wins this one. Mom is usually right. Mom's intuition. So the polling question is going to be, do you feel comfortable removing foreign bodies? Yes. No. No. And I refer to an OMD. No. And I refer to an optometrist. So this question comes out because, you know, as Joe mentioned during the bio, you know, I was president of the POA. I've helped pass three bills in Pennsylvania since my graduation. Since I, when I graduated in 1995, I could only dilate in Pennsylvania. Uh, so the POA has worked hard. We passed a bill in 1996, didn't really go into effect until I think early 1998 as it went through the regulatory process. Then we passed one in 2002 and just recently in 2020, um, we passed a bill and really we keep, you know, moving the profession forward. So removing foreign bodies and that's what the state associations are for, right? They're there to create opportunity you know, if you want to remove a foreign body, treat glaucoma, have a DEA license, it's there if you want to use it. So with that being said, does your, you know, if your state allows, do you feel comfortable removing foreign bodies? Yes, no. Refer to an ophthalmologist or refer to an optometrist. All right, I have trouble, patient, staying fixated, removing a foreign body, suggestions. Yeah, we'll go through that there, Solomon. Let's see what happens as we go through the case here. I'm gonna end the poll, share the results. And it's great to see here that most feel comfortable, 87%, seven don't, and refer to an ophthalmologist. I'm gonna get on my soapbox here and say, let's refer to optometrist, right? I send some specialty contact lenses out, low vision, you know, let's refer to an optometrist. But Joe, with that being said, you're the jurisprudence guy of Florida. You know, Florida has to take jurisprudence. You're the one usually given this. You have a foreign body in your eye. You send it to an ophthalmologist, send it to an optometrist. You as the referring doc, increase liability? No, no, no more increased liability because it, it is it is reasonable. Now, if I were, if there were, if there was a bad outcome, and I was, I was uh, the expert witness, it didn't matter which side I was, I was on. My, my, my opinion would be, well, the person did feel comfortable, did what was right, sent it to somebody else who was capable of doing it. It's just a bad outcome, but there's no negligence here. The only, the only way you can actually be held uh, for negligence is if you knowingly refer. Uh, a patient to somebody who that you know is impaired. Yeah. So, you know, so my soapbox is, you know, refer to optometry, right? You know, it doesn't always have to go down. Now, obviously, if the ophthalmologist is closer, um, but, you know, someone of higher skill is closer and more convenient for the patient, I get that. Um, but, you know, let's remember that we can refer to optometrists that are out there. So this is just me going to show you taking out a foreign body. Um, I'm going to use a 27 and a half gauge needle here. So I'm not sure, you know, I see Solomon, you have in here pacing trouble fixating. Um, you know, what can you do? I'll maybe throw some tips out. Joe can throw some tips out. But maybe what do you guys you like to use to remove a foreign body? As you can see here, 27 and a half gauge needle. I've got the bevel. I'm going to go in here and just kind of lift out this foreign body here. Uh, the, the two that I found on my, uh, when I built this over the weekend, the two that I found, and you're going to see there, I tried lifting it up and it fell off. I'm going to pause the video. I always keep a Wexal sponge or a cotton, cotton tip applicator nearby with, you know, that's just wet, whether it's preparacane or, you know, some phenylephrine, whatever. I just get it wet, whether it's some saline. You're going to see, I tried lifting it off here. It fell off. I want to get that needle away from the eye. So now I'm just going to reach down here. It's all wet and it just kind of lift that right off. Now we got this little bugger right here that we have to go after. This one's pretty easy. Maybe could have just used an algebra brush. Just kind of go in with a needle 
and just kind of lift that right off and lie right out of there. That was pretty easy. That was almost as if it was maybe just a spec that was in there. All right, so you know that's uh, you know the treatment and the removal. <clears throat> you can see here this was before a spec here, a spec here. Now they're gone, and now they're gone. I actually used the the needle instead of an algebra brush to get that out right here. Now I'm going to move into the next one here. Actually, and this great. Is a, go ahead. My, our, our, our good friend Michael Tran, uh huh, who's who's at all our meetings, you know, very nice. He says he likes to use uh, the spud to remove a foreign body and algebra brush to remove the rust ring, and uh, and I, I see golf spud and or algebra brush. And I, I think you know everybody's saying the same thing. I love it. I, mean, I, I like the I like the spud myself. I don't use the algae brush. I will scrape the uh, the rust ring with with the spud. Uh, I don't use the the John Deere power spud at all. I don't use an algae brush. Nothing wrong with it. It's just not my preference. I'm generally pretty happy with the spud. Yeah. So yeah, the algae brush. It's yeah. I I you know I was I was bummed. I thought I thought I had video mm -hmm. on my camera and I just couldn't find it and. It reminded me when putting this lecture together of the weekend that I need to take a little bit better notes so I can get some more of these uh, different types of videos in here. Um, but the, uh, the algebra brush is going to make a, a, an abrasion a little bit bigger. Um, you have a two millimeter abrasion, you're going to end up with a three or four millimeter abrasion. Uh, that's out there. A spud can probably keep, kind of keep that a little bit better controlled. You know, Solomon, regarding the fixation, you know, it's usually good anesthesia. Um, one of the pearls I like pointing out is, you know, preparacane, tetracane, fluoresce. Those are all ester ace type of uh, numbing drops. And like this patient here, they have a hot eye. And so when you put the ester ace in the plasma colon ester ace is leaking out because of the vasodilation, it's going to break it down and you're going to... Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, as soon as you touch it, especially out here by this limbus, as soon as you touch it, they're going to feel it. So I keep a bottle of lidocaine in the office. Lidocaine is an amide and I draw it up in a needle. And if this is a case, I need someone that has really deep anesthesia, take the needle off and drop it onto their eye. Now, deep anesthesia is important. So a good, you know, make sure to, you know, tetracaine, preparacaine or lidocaine. And then, you know, I say to the patient, look, they always want to close that other eye. I have them open up that other eye because as soon as they try and close that other eye, they get that Bell's palsy effect. So I say, listen, it's very important that you keep both eyes open. I'm going to get you a fixation target. That's one other reason why I like a needle. It's small. I don't even tell them it's a needle and, uh, and just, you know, lift that foreign body off, but probably the best two pearls I can give you good anesthesia, both eyes open and have them try and fixate with the eye that doesn't have the foreign body. As soon as they try and close it, they'll Bell's palsy up. But Joe, you have any other uh, any other pearls or people could put in the chat box if they have any other pearls there for for our, uh, for our colleague Solomon. In a case like this, you know, I, I have them look up and, and fixate somewhere up uh, you know, on the ceiling. And that usually helps them a little bit after we give them that, that deep anesthesia. Or if, uh, you know, in the superior cornea, look down, you know, I have, you know, look, look at something on the floor and that gives them something to fixate on. But, at, you know, at that point, they, they're starting to feel a little bit better. And the question I asked, asked if, uh, if we, you know, remove it from the central cornea, I think the answer is it isn't the location kind of, it's the depth. Got to come out. Can't leave, can't leave it there. So, I mean, if it, if I think that we're going to have a perforation, then I, I will send to one of the coronal specialists. If, if it is, if it's in the anterior one third, the stroma, we can move, remove it ourselves. Just can't tell them it's going to scar. Yeah. And yeah, you know, the only other pearl I put on that is, you know, maybe if it's your first one, you know, <laughs> you know, might not cut your teeth on that, maybe refer, refer to an OD. Uh, or an MD, whatever you want to do on that. But uh, yeah, I, uh, location doesn't matter to me. You know, I probably feel I'm probably better at taking more of them out than some of the ophthalmologists in the area. My current closest corneal specialist in Duncansville is Pittsburgh and Harrisburg. So, you know, the patients aren't making that trip. 
So it's usually, you know, me taking it out and taking them out pretty much weekly. You get pretty good at it. So but this in, is just another, that, go ahead, Joe. I'm saying in, in that case where you're looking at central corn, you're expecting staining, you know, add some doxycycline and vitamin A, uh, vitamin C. Yeah. And that's a case too. Now you're talking your Procaris, you know, central mm -hmm. wound, put a Procara on it, regenerize drops, you know, Maxitrol, mm -hmm. minimize that, uh, <clears throat> that inflammation that's out there. This is, I'm going to do this, this other foreign body, you guys, this is another foreign body. Let the questions roll in. 59 year old man with a foreign body sensation started eight days ago, PCP prescribed gentamicin drops, no help. Uh, I think we all had these cases, foreign body sensation is the same. Redness is worsening down here. And here's the foreign body. And you can see here, I just have the patient blinking just to see if it's going to come out and it doesn't. Um, I also, you can see this has been in there a little while, right? They've tried gentamicin. You can see the edema and now the infiltrate, then the redness, the, the white, the redness is pointing right to where the problem is and it's bringing in those white blood cells. So, you know, there's the, uh, you know, blinking, blinking, blinking. There's the foreign body that's just kind of stuck in there. So let's go to this here. And this is a pretty easy one um, to take out. You'll see here, it's pretty superficial. I'm not even sure if it's metal. Hit it with the needle. That's why I like the needle. Push it down. And then you'll see eventually, you know, I could have got the tut and tip applicator, but I just lifted it out right there like that. Yeah, that's the and frustrating you, part is, is when, when it, you, you easily knock it out, then you, then you can't find it to fish it out. All right. And that's why, you know, there's, I usually have work with an assistant and I have everything prepared, right? Because as soon as you try and get away and come back, you know, I'm trying to track that where that piece of foreign body is. So it doesn't go up under the lid, try and keep them fixated, working with my you know, technician, handing me a Lexel sponge, handing me this and making sure I do get that foreign body out of the eye. All right. So what rolled in here, Joe? Uh, Let's see, Michael Tran was there. I touch them and say, you're gonna feel a little pressure, but no pain. Yep, that's good, Ron. That's probably for our colleague. I always make sure the needle is not pointing and aimed. Yep, exactly. Kind of keep it like I was parallel. Cause, and the other thing is make sure their forehead is all the way up against. The last thing you want is two inch gap. You're coming in with a needle and they move forward and now you got yourself a paracentesis. So keep that forehead up against that, you know, that bar. That's a lot of times what my technician does. Keeps them steady, has their, you know, the 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 wet uh, cotton tip applicator or the Wexel sponge there. All right. After removing the central foreign body, would you add a steroid to reduce the scar? Yep. I usually do kind of uh, add, you know, add it uh, right there that day and follow them closely. In what form do you apply vitamin C? I don't usually do vitamin C with, uh, with a foreign body removal. I'll do that with my PRK or PTK patients because when you do PTK, uh, PRK, uh, you can get that with that ultraviolet light, that kind of, that, that haze, but I typically don't, but you know, being an integrative doc, I'll look yes. into it and see if that's worth putting the patient on, but it's such an acute process um, that I'm not sure that uh, the vitamin C, it'd be great to have the vitamin C on board for a couple couple days before they get the foreign body, but I'm not sure how much it would benefit afterwards. I, I think it means only for the, the central ones that are going to scar and maybe affect the visual axis. And I usually recommend oral 1,000 units. They, they, they can just buy that uh, at any grocery store. Uh, I do have a consent form that I use. Good question. And then maybe I'll pull it up on my computer here if I can find it. Um, these are little minor procedures. So I do have them sign a minor procedure form. It helps me with the uh, coding and billing also. And I do have them sign a, uh, 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 that's great. I have to put that in here. First time going through this lecture with you guys, uh, building this and those are things I'm going to make a note on to make sure that I drop in there. Um, is it worth to invest in an eye speculum? Um, um, maybe. I have them at the office. The last time I used one was probably two years ago, but 
It's not to say that tomorrow when I go in and see patients that I wouldn't use it. Joe, do you use an eye speculum much? No, no, I, I use Velcro straps and a bite pad. <laughs> there you go. I use jeweler's forceps to remove any foreign body. Great, great pearl, Ron. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So we, yeah, we showed taking that out. So here's a 41-year-old man, foreign body sensation, history of cataract surgery, May 17th, uh, April uh, 25th of 17. He's had a DSEC procedure. You can see the DSEC. You can see the cataract. Um, which one do they do first? Do they do the DSEC first? Or let's use it in the uh, in the chat box here. When a patient has this done, is the DSEC done first or is the cataract surgery done first? What do you think? IOL, put IOL or cornea. Which one is done first? Let's use the chat box here. And then you're going to see the, the foreign body sensation. IOL, IOL, absolutely IOL. Everyone's rolling in with IOL, IOL. Reason B, and it doesn't matter what, surgeon you have, the guy that's taken out the first cataract or the guy that's the most skilled cataract surgeon that's out there, they do the IOL first because it, and any surgeon kills endothelial cells. So you don't want to transplant it and then go back and do a cataract surgery because you're going to potentially damage the transplanted endothelial or the DSEC. So the IOL is first, the audience is 100% Correct. And then they'll go in and transplant the cornea if need be. But you can see that during one of these procedures, the, the surgeon couldn't get a tight wound and ended up with a broken stitch here, right? After, you know, this is just, I forget the date I should have it on here, but uh, well, this is just recently. This was this month. So I can tell you, this is 2022. This guy comes in with a with a uh, foreign body sensation. And you can see here, whoop, if I let it play and catch it at the right time, you can see that there's even mucus building around this, right? This, this, this suture. Um, he had probably from the DSEC procedure. So four years later, in a sense, this suture breaks. And I'm gonna let this play. And I'm gonna show you, I probably got excited because I wanted to videotape. I'm gonna show you one of my mistakes here. When I tell people to break pull sutures, I usually try to tell them to grab it as close, you know, not at the very tip here, but, you know, somewhere in here, because these sutures have been in there for four uh, years, they're going to be brittle. You're going to see I grab it a little bit too close, probably because I was videotaping, go, oh, I want to get this for teaching. And you can see what I did here, I even broke one of my rules when grabbing this. And I grabbed it a little bit too close. You want to pull and oh, I broke it. Darn. There's a little bit of the suture there. And I'm going to try and go back and grab it and grab it again. And uh oh, did I leave too little? Oh, there I got it. Ugh, couldn't get it. So you can still see now we got a little bit of an exposed stitch here. So now we're going to try and switch weapons here. And now we're going to go in and try and get this suture out. Now, what I want to watch is when you watch how much tension, watch this eye bend. You kind of want to kind of go parallel. And it, you're going to see this eye kind of tug where that knot is, but you'll see it eventually release here. So here we go. Watch this. We're going to lift the lid up. There is that broken suture. Different weapon here coming in with a different tool. Gonna grab this, not so sharp edges, like there's jeweler's forceps. Gonna grab it, gonna grab it. There we go. See the eye moving? Look how much that eye's moving and pop, there it comes. There's the suture that just came out. Uh, so now that patient's gonna be, you know, not gonna have that sensation. We're gonna leave the other sutures in. That's a reminded the patient showed them on the video. There's two other sutures in there. If he gets this foreign body sensation, um, come in and we'll take those other sutures out uh, that's there. So that's a suture removal from, from a procedure. Try and see which way this, the, the suture was put in by the surgeon. Usually it is going kind of sclera to the cornea. They tie the knot and bury it down in there. You kind of want to kind of go that kind of same track uh, to try and get that out 
Um, that's just another little pearl for removing it. Uh, what instrument did you use for the final removal? Uh, it was a forcep. Uh, I, I have probably about uh, five different types of forceps. I don't know the different names of them. If someone knows the name of the forcep, the first one that broke it, it was uh, it was a uh, like a jeweler's forcep. You'll see here when I get to this one up closer to there, you can see it's not as sharp. Oh, I just thought I hit pause, but it must have hit re rewind. So let me hit uh, see if I can get it over the pause button, and hopefully right. Oh. Well, being sloppy, but anyway, you can see there that the that the forcep edges are not um, that sh sharp and able to control that a little bit flatter, and not break that suture. Did you put the patient on antibiotic afterwards? Absolutely. Uh, my favorite, either one you can go with, but Maxitrol, generic Maxitrol, um, or you know Tobradex. The guy had a little bit of a red eye. Um, you want to cover that wound with an antibiotic, so a little bit of antibiotic, a little bit of steroid. The patient's already on a steroid because of the DSEC procedure, you know, once a day, you know, whatever the load of prednol that the patient is on, but I'm still going to cover them with like a maxitrol four times a day for a couple of days. Um, and, by, and by the way, just to, uh, just to throw in, when you take a foreign body out, you, you, you dig something, yeah, it, it might be clean, but still, it doesn't hurt to put an antibiotic on. I know my wife told me a story when she was working with another optometrist uh, uh, when we were at uh, at the university. He would dug a, dug a foreign body out and said, uh, "You know, I, I never I never used antibiotics on, on on these things." And about two days later, the, the patient came back. My wife saw him; he had a corneal abscess that ultimately perforated. So don't don't get cavalier. I mean, th th this person had a perforation because someone was cavalier about it. You know, don't 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 be cavalier. Put an antibiotic in there somewhere. Because if you don't, and it goes badly, you you got some explaining to do. <laughs> Explain is always tough. All right. So here's a 63 year old man. We're going to use the chat box mm -hmm. here. I'm going to play the video. I'll give you the history as we play the video. This is the area you want to watch right in here. I think I scratched my eye three weeks ago. It felt better. Foreign body sensation. I tried refresh artificial tears, helped it first. And I got the right magnification there. And not much help now. And play it again. Chat box, thinks he scratched his eye, got some fluorescein in the eye, you can see, and trying to figure out what this little bugger is right here. What do you think? Let's see if I can pause it without it. Uh... There we go. I see the questions and the answers or the comments rolling in. Filament, filament, mucus plug. That's exactly what we got going on here. We've got a filament, uh, you know, coming in here on this patient's eye. So there's actually a tiny little abrasion here. If I turn on the cobalt blue filter, you can see that there's an unequal edge. Given a nice little, the eye's irritated. It's fill, uh, producing lots of mucus. The eye's trying to fix itself. And it keeps making this long filamentary strand that's on there. And you can see he's blinking. I rubbed it. It didn't want to come off. So now we're going to go in and we're going to remove it. And one of my, as you can see here, it's a little bit easier to see the abrasion now, a little bit closer, zoomed, zoomed in on this, um, on this video. What I like to use are these little, what, you know, what I call Wexel sponges. Um, they use them in the operating room a lot. I'm actually going to kind of fast forward to the next slide here and kind of show you. I love using these on, uh, on corneas. You can see here, it's really narrow. It's like a sphere, you know, they call a cellulose sponge, a Wexel sponge. You can see it's very pointed. You can, you know, have get five in a pack here. They're double packed. They're sterile. That's why I like them. Even cleaner than using some of my instruments at the office. Uh, where I'm using, what is that stuff called? Sidex, I believe, that their instruments are soaking in. We go and rinse them off. These are already in a package. You can see right here, package. 
This is the front of it, flip it over, it's double packed, open it up, and then you have it. And what I like about them too, is if you wet them, they expand out to this really nice soft sponge. So you can use it to kind of, you know, when you numb that cornea, if you're trying to smooth out some things or remove different things, uh, this sponge becomes really soft. So here it is dry, here it is wet. And so what I'm using on this filament to remove, as I play this video here, you're gonna see that I'm using this Wexel sponge. And everyone, I agree, uh, um, you know, what scratched the eye? I don't know. Patient said he thought he scratched his eye. That's a good question. You can see here now, Solomon, I think you were asking about fixating. This guy's all over the place, uh, but we finally got it. And you can see here, that's why I like that sponge. It's really kind of stiff whenever it's not um, wet. And you can see you can kind of just go in there, find the edge of it, and you can just kind of, there's that, there it is. Now I'll just kind of pull it right off. And then, you know, what you could do then is wet that and kind of maybe smooth and remove that epithelium there uh, on that patient. Now, I, you know, it's almost really soft here. And I had a feeling that this might come back. So someone was asking about a little bit earlier about a bandage contact lens. There's those spheres. And you can see on this patient, what I did is I put a bandage contact lens on. You can see this is just a video. This is two days later. You can see the area. I really didn't want another filament to build up. So, and he scratched his eye and it didn't heal right to begin with. So maybe he's got some EBMD underlying cornea issues. So I said to him, I said, listen, you had this filament, get on your eye. I'm going to put a bandage contact lens. Uh, so bandage contact lens, some Maxitrol, and you can see the eyes healing up nicely. The bandage contact lens I like to use is a focused night and day. I keep them all in. I have six rooms at the office. We keep them in all the rooms, minus a quarter, uh, plus a quarter, eight, four, and I think eight, six are the base curves uh, that and they're always in the office. And, you know, patients are a little hyperopic, they get a plus lens or myopic minus lens, whatever. Um, and those are the lenses that I use uh, for the bandage contact lens. So yeah, I kept, go I'm ahead, sorry, I, I, you know, a little quick pearl. Yeah, this can come from trauma, come, can come from dry eye. It's not hard, removing filaments, is not hard, but it's harder than you think. They, the harder than you expect. It's not hard to do, but you look at it and you think, well, they can probably just blink that right away. I call these, you know, ocular leeches. You know, they're like it's like a leech. Yep. You get good, you, yeah. you get you get the tail, but the head's like bitten in. Yeah, and that's true. You know, usually you see them a lot from rheumatoid arthritis. That's the kind of dry eye side of things. You know, I think he scratched his eye, just didn't heal. And then be, being older, dry eye, and then not healing that when then uh, um, that led to that filament. So would you please spell the type of sponge? Yeah, we Wexel, I think someone put it in there, W-E-C-K. They're cellulose sponges. Um, I don't think it's a weak, weak sponge. Um, you can go here. You, I'll go back and see if I can get this. You can see this is the company here. Again, you can use whatever company you want, but these are nice to keep in the office. Um, I use them a lot. Uh, Mucamis uh, used to be used. Um, maybe if they were you know, like a Sjogren's patient, Tom, um, you know, those are the patients are going to get the kind of that recurrent type of filament. This is kind of more, you know, he probably scratched his eye with something and someone asked, what was it? I have no idea, but he just didn't heal. And then he kind of made that edge for that barnacle to kind of grab onto that mucus and he formed that filament. So that's why we kind of took it off with that sponge, smoothed it up, put a bandage contact lens on. I, you know, I'm not really too concerned, you know, that he's going to get a recurrent, but if I thought it was, it'd be something maybe to, 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 to think about. Yeah. And here's a month later, you know, you can see the lens is off. I probably had him wear the lens maybe for, you know, exchanging it maybe for two or three weeks. Uh, really to get that cornea to heal up. And then you can see he looks pretty beautiful uh, The you know about a month out. Uh, do you worry about underlying RCE? Yes, but when I look at the cornea, you know, I'm really not seeing that map dot type of fingerprint. 
but you know there was probably some type of you know you know because maybe you know rce light uh out there uh but you know i'm not too worried about an, an rce uh maybe from the trauma that he had or you know anytime there's cornea trauma you gotta be careful those those microvilli can get damaged at home all right more questions can roll in we'll answer them but as we're doing that do you insert punctal plugs? Yes, no, refer to an OMD, refer to an optometrist. Looks like I might have uh, two lectures in this one, Joe. Maybe we can just split the second half out. We got about, you know, about another 40, 45 minutes and just into a few cases here. Well, that's what happened during my uh, anterior segment, so maybe we should uh, combine them. As long All as people right. are happy and getting what they want out of the, uh, out of the lecture, I think that's uh, that's really what counts. All right, so share the results. Good. 64%, 29% no, that OMD, and 5% to an OD. Good. All right. Let's see if we can get, unless there's, you know, a close proximity reason, let's get that over to an optometrist that feels comfortable putting in plugs. So here's a 75-year-old woman. She's in for a second opinion for her dry eyes. She has a history of rheumatoid arthritis, symptoms of Sjogren's, so, you know, dry mouth, dry eyes, but when they do the SSA and SSB and all the Sjogren's workup, she's not kind of clinically diagnosed, but her symptoms are there. You know, all these rheumatological conditions are so close, these autoimmune. So, but she has rheumatoid arthritis. She has past treatments, numerous over-the-counter artificial tears, everyone I could find, Restasis, Sequa, Zydra, Lodomax solution, Lodomax gel, Inveltus, Isuvis. She was last recommended regenerized drops. That seemed to help. She thought she was getting somewhere, but then just still not enough. So the patient asked about punctal plugs. She read about punctal plugs. And the previous doctors said that she heard in a lecture that they never work. And they cause the inflammatory molecules to sit on the eye. So I have heard, you know, people say, um, you know, drug before plug. That's kind of a saying that's out there, you know, calm down the inflammation before plugging someone, you know, and I've actually heard people say, oh, yeah, you know, never use plugs. They really don't work. There's enough, you know, drops. You got to treat the underlying condition, IPL, all this other stuff. I can tell you that I still use a significant amount of plugs. And right down the road from me is an eight man lady rheumato uh, rheumatology practice. And you can see, you know, Sjogren's, rheumatoid. These patients have some pretty dry eye, <laughs> scant tear prisms. I still do a lot of plugs. So, you know, if you're in that mindset that plugs never work, probably two things in medicine we should never say is always and never. Um, there's reasons out there that we can use plugs that are out there. So I'll get to the questions here soon. Let me kind of, let me run through here. I want to show you, you know, I usually don't do this under a microscope, but for teaching purposes, I'm doing it under a microscope. I'm going to show you a dilating of a puncta, and then we're going to show putting in the plug here. So here I am, I have the lid averted, the patient is numbed up. You're going to see here, I'm going to pause putting the dilator in, and remember, two down, we don't have to go six over, but you're gonna see once I get in, I'm gonna rotate, and I'm gonna dilate pretty, pretty significant here. Not a ton, but enough to, when I get over here, that I can get the plug in. So here we are, dilate, I'm gonna rotate down, and then you're gonna see, I'm just kind of twisting, and boom, I have a nice wide opening for that plug. Now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to bring the plug in. And what you're going to see is when I get, oh, when I get the hate this mouse, I'm going to have to switch to a mouse. When I get that plug in, you're going to see it just kind of pop. And when it pops, you kind of feel it. And that's when you just want to push the button. So here I go. Let me hit the, the play button again. 
And here comes the plug. You're going to see it pop right there. Now I can push the button and let the plug be in place. So that's putting a plug into the, you know, this is looks like the right lower punctum that's there. So I have trouble inserting plugs in a patient left. I am left-handed. Um, I'm left-handed too. Um, I have no problem. You know, if you want to, you know, I, I'm, I've learned to become, I guess, antibidextrous. Is that the correct word? But, you know, at times I de definitely favor that left hand, sometimes even in foreign body removal. So don't be afraid. Turn that patient's head. You can rotate that nose way over and then just kind of, you know, you can work behind the microscope uh, to get that plug in. Uh, don't, don't be afraid. The patient doesn't always have to keep their head like this. You know, you can turn that head, get it in there, get that rotated so that you can maybe get that left hand in there. Uh, I've been doing punctal plugs for over 20 years and I am in, is that Massachusetts? Is that Massachusetts? MA? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Uh, any thoughts on Tiravaya? Um, Tiravaya is pretty cool there, Robert. Um, yeah, this is, we can add it to this patient's list. Um, uh, I like Tiravaya because you know, it's a nicotinic receptor in the base of the nose here. And what it does, it stimulates the parasympathetics and it creates all the, all the tears to be produced. But I just don't think that this patient would, um, I could try it, you know, but I'm going to go plugs on this patient first. If they're fail, I would go tear value on this patient and let that patient stimulate that, that tried or that parasympathetic system and now those plugs can build up all those natural tears, the mucin layer, the tear layer, uh, and the oily layer um, that, that gets produced. So that's a pretty cool thought on this, but I'd probably do it secondary rather than primary. All right, anything else? Okay, good. Punctal plugs. I mean, we did that, showed that video and showed that video. All right, 48-year-old woman, foreign body sensation, diagnosed with trichiasis, epilation, performed. Comments or questions go in the chat box. Any concern with these misdirected lashes? Let's see here. So here we are. Watch how I pluck these and watch where they go when I pluck them. I'm going to pull it and I want to work. I want to be quick. So sometimes I'll wrap a tissue around my finger and just kind of put them all there. Sometimes I wipe, wipe them on the patient's lower lid. Patient might have some demodex there. I don't really see too many scurfs. Yeah, maybe right there where the forceps are, down, down to the left there. There's a, there's a blondie in here or a gray one I'm trying to get. There we go. Uh, and... You know, looks like this patient might have had maybe a, a hordeolum at one point, uh, a chalazian, and you know some type of some type of issue here. Um, but you know, there's a lot of basal cells that can occur on that lower lid um, that's out there. Again, this is the video playing again. But if I go to the end here and pause it, you know, I really don't see any type of you know, uh, kind of ulceration that's that that's out there. So I'm not really seeing anything kind of rolling in. Some, potentially some demodex here, maybe some you know cleardex or tea tree oil. Tarsus is coming out uh, with a demodex treatment here in the next year. If you guys want to look something up, TPO3. It should be out sometime in 2023. I'm going to the academy. I have a um, well, what do they call it? An advisory board meeting with them the Wednesday of the, uh, of the Academy. We'll learn a little bit more. Okay, Greg, but, somebody, a question came in about using uh, permanent plugs or semi-synthetic plugs right away, as opposed to the, the dissolvable collagen. I, I, I'm 50-50 myself. Yeah, I'm probably more the other way, maybe because I deal with a little bit more from that rheumatology practice, a little bit more, maybe some advanced dry eyes or some maybe autoimmune dry eye. Um, if I'm trying to get a temporary fix, you know, I'll put maybe some temporary plugs in there or, 
you know, semi-synthetic. Um, but, you know, a lot of times I just go right to, you know, permanent plugs like I showed you there with that kind of silicone material. And I, um, I, I do find those easier to put in. It's out there. Yep. So this one I thought was kind of neat, right? Here's uh, a 77-year-old woman, status post-cataract extraction. She had it done, you know, somewhere else, but, uh, you know, the doc was like, look, I don't do glasses. Go see uh, these guys over here and get your post-op glasses. So the refraction was completed and that's all the patient was really in for, but new patients. So I said, let me just kind of take a look and see how the surgery went. And, uh, but let's take a look at the, the, the lashes here. Um, this is the right eye and this is the left eye. I'm sorry, this is still the right eye. That's the upper lid, lower lid. And then Here's the upper lid of the left eye. Cataract surgery looks beautiful. Yeah, let's get you a pair of glasses, 2020. But then as I looked, I didn't like this here. Right? Like, what's what's going on here? So I said, all right, let's rotate this out a little bit. You see this here? I don't like that. What else is here? Lash, lash, lash. Where are the lashes? No lashes. And we're, so the, remember, cancer usually eats away. That's why if you see verrucas, if you see, uh, um, yeah, like verrucas or skin tags, they're not cancerous, they kind of grow out. Cancer can eat away. You know, Michael Tran, our, our buddy here, puts, you know, looks like squamous cell. Joe, yeah, cancer, uh, for sure. It's definitely a suspicion. Um, when I lived in uh, Rhode Island, Blue Cross won a punctal plug uh, success before reimbursing for silicon. Well, they're the ones losing money, I guess. You're making money doing a double procedure, but that's the way. I'm a third-party chair for Pennsylvania. I totally get that, that you have to do maybe two things to, to get to the one thing that you're looking for. Uh, basal cell, Keith, but I think there was something else I saw up here. Do you do uh, upper or just uh, lower? Uh, John, if the patient is a Sjogren's patient, they usually need all four. Um, the extreme dry eye, filamentary keratitis patients usually need four. You know, I, if I do all four, I tell the patient, look, the worst thing you're going to happen is you're going to have to carry a tissue around uh, for a day or two until I can get the uppers back out. Um, so there's times when I do do all four, but 90% of the time it's just the lowers, um, Sjogren's filamentary keratitis patients, uh, all four and tell them, look, Epiphora, they'll come in, they'll know it. They'll be watering and you just pull out the uppers. All right. Lower squamous cell. All right. So. Again, these are just pictures from the video. I didn't like how this was ulcerating. I don't like how the lashes are missing. These are all just pictures. So I sent it to my oculoplastics person and he did a punch biopsy. And this is my patient. I'm not sure. She sent this video. I'm not sure what, oh, it's just a short video. She probably was trying to take a picture. Confirm basal cell, right? So I see people putting squamous cell, basal cell. Those are all options. There was a study done one time where they had the docs that were really good at oculoplastics try and guess. And they were right 50% of the time and wrong 50% of the time. And that's the beauty of the biopsy. So, you know, you can make a guess, seen them before, but that's what the biopsy is all about. So she had her punch biopsy that's done under here, basal cell carcinoma. Here she is after her Mohs procedure. And check this out. She had that little lesion now she's got some type of shield on her eye here that they use for the Mohs procedure. She's not missing an eyeball here. She's got some type of conformer in her eye, but in the Mohs procedure in where they take out tissue and the pathologist is in the room next door, same room, however they do it, they're actually reading the tissue to make sure that the edges are clear, making sure they got all the cancer. 
So now here she is with her Mohs procedure. And remember, it started off as this little lesion right here. And that's why you want to get these basal cells. Basal cells typically don't kill, but they go down, come over, come back up, go down. They're like a, a bad weed in your garden and or in your grass or in your yard. They, they spread. And so they took all of this tissue to get rid of uh, to get rid of that. Oh, so this, she sent me these pictures. So here's a week after reconstruction. And you can see here that it looks pretty good. Um, there's a little video here. The patient has a tarsorophy, so she can't get her eye open. Her eye has been sewn shut uh, purposely, but she came in for me to get this video to kind of, because we've been going through this. She was very happy that she went for cataract surgery and during her glasses examination, we found this, you know, this basal cell on her eye. So she knows I teach. And so she wanted to try and help me out and get as much video as possible or get it. So here she is here. She's sending me pictures on her cell phone. She's at her house, how she's healing up here uh, really nicely. Uh, here she is one month after the, the procedure. Um, she just had this eyelash kind of stuck in here. So I'm going to remove it. But uh, what I want to show here is how nice this, this came out. This is one month. And you can see she, part of her, her, her lacrimal system was involved, right? Her punctus. And now she kind of has a DCR in place. You know, just this little bit of a uh, little bit of a divot here uh, of a tissue after that big old wound that she had. showing the tube here. And then here she is two months. She was just in the other day. This is probably not more than uh, uh, a week old. I think she was in last week. And you know, she looks great, uh, her basal cells. So these, these oculoplastics guys, wherever they take and, you know, autographs and skin from wherever, uh, they do a great job of, of reconstructing these uh, patients. So she looks great uh, after, uh, oh, here she is eight months. This is, that was two months, I'm sorry. This is eight months. This was the one from the other day. She had the surgery in February. Just a little bit of a nub of some tissue. You can see a little bit of a wound here. She, their tube is out now. Um, she doesn't have any epiphora. She's super, super excited. Yeah, beautiful reconstruction. I agree, Heather. All right, so here we go again, right? This lady was just in the other day and uh, I already pulled the lashes out. I kind of kicked myself, but... Uh, she had these misdirected lashes. They were going in, I already epilated them, but I don't like this area right here. I don't like how it's going down. I don't like how it's atrophying here. So she's off to, uh, to, the, uh, to the same doc here, Dr. Chu, who did these, this other one. He's my favorite, or one of my favorite oculoplastic guys in the area. It's actually about 60 miles away. But look at this, history of basal cell removal. She has this basic Dupre Cristal syndrome, uh, which is they're doing a, a study on her at the Hershey Medical Center, her and her family. But if you look closely, you can see I just don't like how this is this is ulcerating. So stay tuned. We might have an update on this patient. So, but what do you see here on this patient? You know, what am I going for here? Is her bifocal too high? Is she cross-eyed? Does she have a sixth nerve palsy? You know, does anyone see what I'm going for here in this chat box on this patient? What do we got here on this patient? Yeah, Keith, you got it there, my friend, right here, right? We always, you know, we always seem to get focused on this part right here. I said to her, I said, uh, when I walked in the room, I said, hey, I see you here for an eye exam. Uh, what's going on with your nose? <laughs> She's like, oh, yeah, I kind of scratch it with my finger now and it just won't heal up. Well, um, did anyone ever mention to you, you know, if it's not healing up, maybe she get it biopsied. 
um, and that turned out to be a basal cell, right? So this is a basal cell right here, but she came in to have this done. And this guy comes in and, you know, you got to ask the question, right? He comes in, there's really, I mean, he's got some dry eye issues or some meibomian gland or something going on with his eye. I forget the history here that we're working on him with. Uh, and we're trying to get him healed up. But I said to him, I said, what's going on with this right here? Right. What's, you know, just, you know, it just happened to be, you know, working from this side. And I look into his ear and this turned out to be squamous cell here. So, you know, he's, he came in, he's like, Hey, I came in for my eye exam and the doc found something in my ear and you can see right there. So, you know, let's examine the patients. It doesn't really, uh, you know, take too much to get things biopsied uh, that's out there and, and we can help these patients out. This one here, I wasn't sure what was going on. I knew it wasn't good. Um, you could see she's got this growth. She's got this ectropion. This is when you hear mechanical ectropion. This is a big old growth on her eye. And it turned out to be a Merkel cell carcinoma. You know, So we just got her to the, to the lid specialist um, and she had that removed. Uh, unfortunately, about three years later, that's what she died from, uh, was a Merkel cell cancer. Uh, but at least we got this off of her eye, was able to reconstruct her eyelid and keep her eye comfortable that's out there. Uh, clinically, what's the difference in appearance of a cavernous divot or an ulceration or simple scarring from a hordeolum? And you know, that's a, you know, a great one, Heather. I just had one in the other day and this is a brand new lecture and I was building it all weekend. And I just had one come in the other day that, um, one of my colleagues said, you know, what do you think, you know, um, hordeolum or, or do you think this could be basal cell? And I said, well, let's put some steroid on it. Let's put some, uh, maxitrol ointment on it. And if it gets better, it's most likely not, uh, a hordeolum or some type of infection or inflammation. Now it could have two things. So we got to watch it closely, but this person did get better and I can kind of show the progression. But, you know, basal cells not going to kind of get clinically better with an antibiotic steroid. So that might be a good way to kind of test those and watch them. That's out there. Joe, any any pearls on that? No, not really. I mean, they're, they are very hard to tell and you just you just don't really know. That's why uh, that's why we have to make the referral. You know, but if something something, you know, doesn't seem right to you. You know, there's there's no harm in getting a second opinion from uh oculoplastic person or, or, or a dermatologist. So a uh, conjunctival laceration, um, you know, do they need to be sutured? Yes, no, not always, but most of the time, if extremely large laceration, I don't know, that's why I'm here. You know, do conjunctival lacerations need to be sutured? I think I have this set up as a multiple choice. So there could be a couple answers if you want to answer that way. Good participation tonight, guys. Thanks for mm -hmm. making this interactive, live and interactive. With that being said, uh, we can continue to do these if so long as they're live and interactive. All right. So with that being said, good participation. I'm going to end the poll. Share the results and yes, 7%, no, 20%, not always, uh, but most of the time, if extremely large. So the probably the two answers that I would go with is no, they don't need to be uh, uh, sutured, but in that extremely rare case, you know, maybe some really bad trauma. Uh, and the conjunctiva is maybe hanging out of the eyelid there and over onto the, maybe hitting the cheek. Yes. So those rare cases, most of the time, conjunctival lacerations don't need to be sutured. So here's a 54-year-old man that comes in. He was hit with a piece of siding yesterday. Um, he thinks he scratched his eye and uh, he just reports a headache today. But if you look closely, you can see he's got lots of swelling. He has cut this conjunctiva all the way down to his sclera. So 
Yeah, I said to him, I said, yep, you not only scratched your eye, but the good news is the uh, you missed the cornea, you got the conjunctiva, which you hear of conjunctivitis, that's the skin, and then your sclera did what it was supposed to do. This big Teflon shell doesn't look like it was cut at all. So you just cut your conjunctiva. Now we got to manage watching for infection, dealing with the pain, and allowing this conjunctiva to eventually uh, grow closed here. So we put them on uh, Maxitrol, generic, every one to two hours. Um, then uh, after that, uh, for two days, he did every one to two hours. And then uh, we put them on four times a day. We did Tylenol, 1,000 milligrams, uh, and the ibuprofen for the pain as needed. Uh, we watched his pressure because he's on Maxitrol and his pressure is pretty good, maybe up a little bit in the eye using the Maxitrol. And so this was a week later and you can still see he has a pretty nice gash. I'm really not sure what this is. He had some type of dirt. I did take it out of his eye for him. Uh, but you can still see that this wound is, is still here. Uh, Maxitrol was still four times a day until the wound is closed. And the Tylenol and ibuprofen, you know, 1,800, just kind of as needed uh, for the pain. And then about three weeks later, you know, his pressure's maybe up a little bit more in the eye because of the Maxitrol. We're watching his pressure. Maxitrol uh, was almost empty. His wound was pretty well closed at this point. So I just said, you know, when your Maxitrol runs out, we'll just put you on Lodomax. I really didn't see a need to have the antibiotic. There's really no open wound at this point. And he can continue to use that Tylenol. And I, I said, keep on your Lodomax uh, twice a day. We'll check you back in about six or eight weeks. And he healed up beautifully. Um, there's a nice little close up here. Has a little subconch heme. The, uh, the remodeling has taken place, you know, really nice. Um, so I had him use Lodomax once a day. I shook the bottle. It wasn't that full. So don't be concerned. Like I gave him a full bottle of, you know, five milliliters and he's going to be using it for the next six months. He came in, I said, just use this once a day until the bottle was empty. He really didn't need the Tylenol. I said, look, if he gets a little painful, it gets a little ache as it's healing. You could see the Lodomax once a day has dropped his pressures down to being 12.6 uh, and 12.9. Uh, and I just said, look, just come in for whatever your routine exam is or your comprehensive eye exam, and we'll follow you up. So lacerations, conjunctiva, unless the conj is literally hanging out of the eye, you can just kind of watch them and watch them uh, kind of heal nicely. Joe, any pearls? Well, the thing about the conjunctival laceration is the they're generally pretty benign. Uh, there's not a lot of nerve endings there. They're not in a lot of pain. You want to clean it. Uh, if you, if you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll ointment them up. You can use a, a pressure, you know, you, don't be afraid to use a pressure patch uh, overnight on these. I try to smooth over the conjunctiving and get it back in position without, you know, without suturing. If you can't really get it uh, or, or you, it, it's very loose, yeah, you know, just you know, cut a piece or two. I, I had a, I, I had a, a woman not that long ago, and uh, she hit herself, you know, pulling out uh, a little toy flag, and she stabbed herself and gave herself a nice uh, conjunctival abrasion. I tried to smooth it over, looked really good, but you know, end up a lot of you know redundant tissue. And I said, well, if you want. Uh, I can cut it out. I said, no, I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. So just try to smooth it out. Don't be afraid. Maybe use a pressure patch overnight and we'll be fine. Yeah, that's another good thought there of using a pressure patch. Ken writes, uh, or Kenneth wrote, uh, would you always use a combo antibiotic and steroid or can you use an antibiotic and then add a steroid after one week? Um, you know, there's a lot of trauma in this case here, Ken. You can certainly use an antibiotic if you want to say, if you want to say, if you say you're playing it safe, um, you don't want that steroid on board, but, you know, they're going to swell pretty quickly. There's a lot of inflammation. And in this case, you know, there's, there's a lot of trauma. It probably hit the sclera, um, you know, so you're going to probably get a lot of inflammation, which if you want to cover it for a week, 
and then address the inflammation a little bit later. But uh, typically I see a lot of, you know, uh, conjunctival lacerations and we just get them right on because the eye can swell pretty good. Even after 36 hours, sometimes these people get cut on Friday and they're like, oh, I didn't know I could call you and come in. And um, yeah, you see them on Monday and they're just like totally swollen. So uh, whatever you feel comfortable with, but I'd probably go pretty quickly with the steroid. Oh, I was hitting the eye with a tree branch and I think I scratched my eye. I'm like, yeah, it looks like you did. And then I'm like, well, is that part of the tree branch that's in there? Or what is that? Is that bark? So numbed his eye up. This was a case of lidocaine. All right. Got the lidocaine. But like Joe said, uh, the conjunctiva doesn't have a lot of nerve endings, just like the adjacent tissue, the cornea, most innervated, the cornea next to it, one of the less innervated conjunctiva. So I got in there and started kind of moving things around. And then I found this. It was a thorn in his eye. So uh, I said, luckily you got this in the, again, the white part, the conjunctival part uh, of the eye. Um, you can see here, I used uh, this type of spud type of tool to kind of, you can see he's cut here, kind of move things around. He's got a big subcon team, found out where it went in, kind of move things over. Kind of wish I would have videotaped this one, but you can see here with the forceps, I was able to get out that. Uh, that thorn that kind of broke away from that tree branch that hit him in the eye. And there it is, nice little close up. And then, you know, conjunctival lac laceration, Maxitrol started that day. And you can see here, he's healing up nicely. Um, you know, whatever this is, five, seven days later, healing up and he healed up nicely once we got the, the foreign body out of his eye. So polling question number four is, do you use an OCT to measure your cornea trauma or infection depth? Yes, no, never thought to do so. So the OCT, we use it a lot for glaucoma, GCC, nerve fiber layer. Uh, we can use it for, um, you know, diabetic retinopathy, you know, epiretinal membranes, macular holes. You know, some of them have an anterior segment type of lens that we can use. So have you ever used it to, and I'll let that kind of polling question run and we'll end it here. But uh, let me show you this guy that comes in and I thought he was trying to get on opioids. You know, Tracy and I, we do this lecture on opioid diversion and guy comes in, he's in extreme pain. Yeah, I was using this razor blade type of knife. I was just working on it. Man, my eyes in extreme pain. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I saw this nice little, kind of cut right here and i'm like what were you using yeah it's like this really sharp razor blade blah 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 and uh so i said to my technician i said sarah i said you know he's in a lot of pain go give me an oct and kind of run it right through here and you can see you know he went pretty pretty good he gave himself a nice little rk self rk incision here uh on his cornea and you can see i took uh the OCT and was able to measure it. And, and if I go here, you can see going from the top kind of down to the edge here, a 407 microns. And you know, his cornea kind of here, if I just did this, was you know almost 600. So he's kind of two thirds of the way through his eye here. Um, so he, you know, this was pretty nice to manage. Uh, he had a lot of pain because there's a lot of corneal nerves in the in the eye. So, you know, the Tylenol, the, the ibuprofen, maybe some Darvacet. Uh, so maybe it was, maybe I thought he was coming in for opioids, but not really. He had a really good reason to, to use a, uh, not a Darvacet, but uh, an Altram 50 milligrams there to, to, to do it. How can you uh, be sure that the thorn did not penetrate the sclera? Uh, you know, on this case back here, you know, when I was manipulating and looking at the wound, um, you know, it, it didn't look like it penetrated the cornea. We did dilate them that day or the next day and took a look at the retina uh, out there. So, you know, obviously it would be inferior, um, but, uh, you know, he healed up nicely and cleared up nicely. So dilation, examination is probably the way that uh, it didn't penetrate the sclera. Good question, Jay.
Do you have to worry about fungal infection with the thorn? Sure, you got to worry about bacteria, fungal, viral, any type of microbial infection with it. Um, do I worry? No. Am I concerned about it? Yes. Um, I didn't, you know, steroid his eye and patch him. I didn't close that environment. He's tearing, he's watering. Um, so yeah, we got to be concerned. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's a vegetative material, uh, that's there, but, uh, you know, I, I was concerned, but I'm also concerned about the inflammation, uh, that he has too. Joe, any concerns about putting a steroid on that? Some concerns with, uh, you know, with the possibility of fungus, but you know, steroid to what's necessary. I mean, that, that's going to, that's going to help the eye heal. So yeah, some concerns I'm going to be aware. And I think one of the ways to mitigate the uh, issues with steroid is close follow-up. Yep. And that's what we did for him. We watched him closely. If any signs of you know, worsening redness, inflammation, maybe back off on the steroid. The drawback to fungus that's out there, and I've treated fungal ulcers, is they're slow to grow and they're slow to get rid of. So, you know, the issue like with a fungal keratitis is, you know, they could take, you know, weeks to kind of, you know, or if you want to say conjunctivitis, take weeks to start showing their face because fungus are slow, slow growers. But then once they take a hold, they're slow, slow, slow to get rid of. So great question. So here's a patient that came in, a 43-year-old man. This is just me having fun, playing around. You know, here's a, here's a dendrite. Obviously, it's a herpes simplex. So I said, okay, let me run, you know, a line through this. And you can see what it looks like, right? You can see that uh, there's a lot of swelling and inflammation uh, and seeing what's going on with... Uh, with the, uh, with the edema there. And I thought this was pretty fun. I had uh, Sarah, she's my technician. She's my right and left arm, but I had her kind of cut right through here. And you can just kind of see how that, so patient's not thinning. You can see the edema that's going on in this cornea from this lesion, the, 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 the kind of the, the blockage of the signal because of the, the inflammation that's going on. So, you, you know, don't forget, you can use your, 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 uh, um, OCT that's out there. And that's kind of what I want to kind of talk about and kind of move into infectious keratitis here. Uh, this was one that was handed to me probably about 10 days into it. Um, you know, this wasn't clearing up. It's getting worse. Um, here's a nice infectious keratitis, right? And so PCR did, it was staph, coag, negative, and propion bacterium, kind of two bacterias that are found on the eyelid. One's an anaerobic and one is uh, aer aerobic. And nice big old, you know, 2.34 millimeter uh, infection here. Said to the patient, you want to go to the cornea specialist, Pittsburgh, Hershey, no, no, no. Okay, looks like we're going to follow this and battle this bad boy. You heard me talk about another uh, maybe other webinars that we battled this thing for about about eight weeks. Just saw her today. I should put a, a follow up picture. She's doing great. Um, but this is what I was doing was managing this patient. You can see the ulcer. She's thinning, and this is right before adding the steroid. And so you can see, you know, she's about five, you know, thirty six here. But what I was trying to do is you can see the epithelium is just not closing over. I just couldn't get this wound. I mean, I was seeing her every other night. We're going at nine o'clock at night, eight o'clock in the morning, Saturday, Sunday. Um, we got her. But this is the day after adding the steroid. And that's what I want to point out is that look how she's 536 here uh, in microns. But then a day later, she's 472. Right. And so when you look at that, you're like, oh, my gosh, now you're causing that cornea to melt. No, we're pulling the swelling out. The swelling went down on that cornea. And so we really didn't thin her out and, and, and melt her at all. And we followed her over time. You can see she's 504 over here. I tried getting as close to where the edema wouldn't be impacted. But this what I was trying to do. It took me a while to finally get this epithelial wound to close and once we did, then she's healed up nicely. And you can see she thinned from this 
uh, on this infectious keratitis. You can see, luckily, um, you know, it's below the pupil here, maybe a little bit on that pupillary border that's there. And uh, again, watched her closely. You can see I'm cutting up through the wound this way, making sure she's not thinning anymore, making sure she's not going to perforate. Uh, I can see here that her epithelium has finally grown over that wound. And you can see now, if you go back to like the original ones, you can see that how dense this is. Look, the the coherent light can't even get through. That's how much swelling and infiltrate there is. But you can see as we start adding the steroid, getting rid of the swelling, that's how I could also tell we were healing, the coherent light is going through. And again, now you're getting all the different layers because this, this scarring is, is, is healing. So it's just using, uh, here she is, uh, maybe, uh, maybe 10 week battle. She was just in today. Um, I can probably update it, but it didn't really look much different. But this is where I started. This is where she was when she was healing. You can see the wound is still open. But, you know, here she is afterwards. Um, and we got this bad boy cleared up here. Um, I think she's just blinking there. There you go. You can see kind of that little divot, but we got her cleared up. So we'll go through and uh, we'll talk about PCR testing and kind of get her get it, get this webinar kind of landed here. Uh, I'm going to end this poll and uh, we'll start uh, poll number five, I think it is. And just asking, uh, have you ever performed polymerase chain reaction on a patient? Not for COVID. Uh, PCR became cool, right, for, for COVID. Uh, you're doing it for testing on a, you know, an ocular condition in the, in the practice. Yes, no, never thought to do it. Didn't know it could be done. And that's why I'm here. So yes, no, and it might be multiple choice. So maybe it's no, and they, maybe you'll do it. Uh, you know, Greg, looking at the responses, I think this is uh, it's going to be a very be you know, very good benefit for everybody out there to uh, let them know about this uh, this uh, option. Yeah, and I have to you know thank Joe. You know, I played around trying to find a company, and Joe found this company. Again, no proprietary interest. Find whoever you want, and uh, this company has been great to deal with. So, so I'm just going to kind of play this, you know. PCR versus culturing, you know, PCR is uh, faster, it's more sensitive, it's more accurate than a culture. PCR results are not dependent on the lab's abilities, nor the time it takes to grow the bacteria. See, we're not culturing anything here. And here's the reference, if you want to go read about it, all I did is PCR versus culturing hit the uh, you know, Google and then screenshotted this. And here's the reference of this quote right here. So, you know, you used to say that you take the swab and you had to be careful not to use a numbing drop because the BAK in a numbing drop could kill the bacteria. Then you had to put it on all the different augers and grow it. And it was delayed and maybe the bacteria would die. You didn't, this is done with polymerase chain reaction where it's using RNA, DNA type of material multiplying it, multiplying it, and then you're able to find out like, so it doesn't take much and a bug can be dead and it can tell you what's, what's going on. So it's really not, you know, culturing that's out there. You could say, well, it's culture-ish, right? Because that's what we're used to saying, like Kleenex or tissue. We know what you're saying, right? So culturing, but it's truly not culturing that's out there. It's a, it's a polymerase chain reaction. So with that being said, Joe, these are your slides. Do you want to kind of just talk about them? And then I'll do a case and we'll land this uh, like Delta. Yeah, the, the, this gives you really rapid. And when I say rapid, you know, I, I can only get my results within about two days. Uh, infectious diseases, bacteria, viruses. You can, uh, you can find my, mycobacteria, anaerobic bacteria. Uh, other things that you just really have a hard time, uh, a hard time, uh, uh, you know, identifying. Uh, next slide. And th this right here is my culture, my quote unquote culture kit. Uh, I have, uh, we have a labeler, label maker, 
to put the patient's name, uh, date of birth on. There is a steriflot. This is a lot like your old culture, you know, culturettes. But if you look at what we have on the right, it's like a Brillo brush. You can, you can, you can remove the epithelium with that. You can, you can uh, uh, denude a cornea with that. You, you can really get uh, get some uh, material in there, and it's put into this transport media. It is put into this biohazard uh, with the patient's insurance information, and it is shipped off via UPS. What we have a technician, uh, you know, our, our Sarah, so to speak, is Elisa, and she uh, she'll do all of this for me. I, I do I do the uh, I do the swabbing of the lesion. She packs it up. She calls the rep the rep the rep identify or arranges a UPS pickup. They come to get it. Yeah, on a on a Monday, if you do it on a Monday morning, by the time the patient comes back Wednesday afternoon, by and large, you're gonna have the results. Next slide, please. And these are things that they're looking for: acanthamoeba, aspergillus, fusarium, uh, Neisseria, toxoplasma, uh, Enterobacter, E. coli, Moraxella, Cutibacterium, uh, Demodex, Chlamydia. Corinne bacteria. Look at all these things they're going to be testing for. Now, granted, they're not great for fungus. You know, they're only okay for fungus, but uh, you have a pretty robust list of things that they're going to look for. Uh, Greg, next one, please. And they're going to go through. Then uh, this is this was a a patient I saw with a infectious keratitis. You can see what they found was staph species uh, uh, detected, 600,000 copies per milliliter, which was a moderate microbial load. And you can go through and you can see what, you know, what, or, what uh, antibiotics that they're susceptible to. Now, here's a little bit of a knock. They don't do a lot of ophthalmics, but you'll get the, uh, the levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, gadafloxacin. So there are a number of things in there that uh, it will test for. Uh, but that, that trimethoprim is uh, by mouth or, or IV. Uh, would a test be still be valid if they had been initiated with an antibiotic? The answer is uh, yes. Next one, next one, Greg. Yeah, because remember, you don't have to worry about killing the bacteria. If the bacteria is dead, it's still going to have mm -hmm. its DNA there. Oops. And uh, this is the company that I use is called healthtrackrx.com. We don't have any, you know, any preparatory uh, interest in this. It's just a good, uh, a good service. They're great. They'll get you set up. They'll get you your materials. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, they will bill your patient or they will bail, bill the patient's insurance that doesn't go through. If it is a, a cash pay, it's about $125 to $150. I forget what it is. But understand, there's also a procedure code, 65430, scraping the cornea for smear or culture. And you can bill it $109 to do this. Now, here's a patient with a, with a keratitis off axis. You can see it's an angry eye. I will do, I, I will test every patient, every, you know, not corneal abrasions, but I will do every suspected focal keratitis like this. And I can tell you right now, they all come back positive. They're, you know, all the ones that you think are infectious, they are infectious. And you may wonder, well, if you're just gonna treat them anyway, you know, what, what is this useful for? Well, I can tell you, you know, medical legally, if something goes badly, First thing they're going to ask is, where is the culture? Where, where was the microbiology involved here? And just a few weeks ago, I had a patient who had uh, a very unusual keratitis, uh, two lesions. I actually thought it was fungus. It had like a fungal type of appearance to it. So I, I, I did the uh, quote unquote culturing. And I put the patient on moxifloxacin, and it came back. Uh, the patient actually was, uh, had three bugs. You know, there are three different bacteria that was identified. Two were very susceptible to moxifloxacin. One was not. And looking at my options, the, the most susceptible that it was to was uh, oral doxycycline. And I would never have thought to use oral doxycycline uh, on that patient, but I put the patient on 
And uh, lo and behold, she uh, she did very well. So it does make a difference. It's a great service. You can quote unquote culture these, you know, all these patients with minimal difficulty. You don't need a great deal of skill. They do a lot of the heavy lifting. Okay, Greg, why don't we just land? I'll let you do a case and land it. Okay. So with that being said, I just want to kind of clarify being the third party chair, you could charge whatever you want. The national average of this procedure is probably 109.7. Uh, you could charge whatever you want since we have a gathering here, uh, charge whatever you want in your practice. Thank you, Greg. So with, uh, with that being said, I'll go through actually two cases here, Joe, of using PCR. This is a 65 year old woman. She comes in, her eye is swollen, it's itchy, it's her right eye. She tried using warm compresses, artificial tears, no improvement. Started mm -hmm. yesterday, worse today. Patient reports she was bike riding and, you know, she, oops, she stopped. She stopped and used the porta potty. It was not clean. There's no toilet paper. She said it was kind of grody. Her hands weren't clean. Um, you know, she, then later on, she's like, you know, she's concerned now that her eyes are red because she did rub her eye with the hands and so on and so forth. So she comes in. And, you know, here's her eye and she's got this conjunctivitis. But yet when you look here, watch this video, this area right through here at this superior limbus. She's got this kind of Trantus Horner dot type of kind of condition going on here. You know, so I'm like, all right, I, you know, I see a lot of red eyes in the practice. And look at that right there along that limit. She had this kind of weird inflammatory reaction. So I said to her, I said, listen, I'm going to start you on my favorite Paxitol drops. I'm going to put you on an oral antibiotic, but I'm going to PCR you. And uh, you can see here, this is what I didn't like. See how it's like these Trantus Horner dots, this limbal reaction going on. And so here we are here. If you want to see uh, how I did the, the PCR test, here's that test right there that Joe's talking about, just kind of going down in that area. And then I'm just gonna kind of scrub over these limbal areas here. She is, you know, I think she's probably numbed up there. I'm just kind of rotating, trying to get as much as I can here of this, of this uh, going back in, getting a little bit more, just trying to figure out what's going on uh, with this young lady. So, Let's see here. That's that. That's that. Let's see. So the plan was PCR testing right eye. I put her on Augmentin, Maxitrol, and came back in a day. And she started getting better, right? Here she is yesterday. I didn't cause any problems with the steroid. Like, what's going on? And uh, so I get the PCR test back. And here it is right here. You can see it's of the conjunctiva. And you can see she has this kind of Pepto streptococcal type of bacteria. And that's a normal flora, but usually like in the vaginal or anal area. So I'm like, hey, maybe she did pick something up uh, in that from that porta potty. And then you could see a kind of a normal bacteria. Now she had this kind of pathological bacteria lower. And usually, like Joe said, you get these different types of bacteria growing whenever you stress the eye. So the normal bacteria start getting out of control. And so then they can sometimes recommend, here was another one, a normal florist staff. So she kind of had three bugs here. They did the sensitivity against the staff, but you can see right here. But the good news is double pluses tell you that it's susceptible and then a single plus and then a zero. And the good news is if you come over to the penicillins, I did use amoxicillin and it was a plus on it uh, and calaviranic acid. And then, you know, if you go through and find the, I should probably circle them, find the maxitrol drops. And that's why it worked really, really well. Again, here's the rest of the, the printout and what it looks like. And the doctor signs off on it. This is a 16 year old child. This is a pretty cool one right here. Um, they were like, hey, I hear you're pretty good at some of this stuff. Here's a guy that's 16 years old with affection. Uh, this is his sixth opinion. He's currently using polytrim and cephalexin. Remember that, polytrim and cephalexin. The infection started two years ago. 
He's been to he's been to a primary care doc, optometrist, ophthalmologist, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. So he comes in and if you just look, he's just got this goopy, like literally he's got goop pouring out of his eyes. And I feel bad for this child. You can see it's chronic. You can see the amount of bacteria. You can see it's in the crevices here. He's got bacteria. Look at his lashes, just tons of, of goop. So I said, this is easy. And I said, I don't have to really do anything. Um, can you give me the list of things that you'd be on? And I'm going to do PCR testing on you. Check this out. From 2020 all the way through 2022, cephalexin, polytrim, olipatidine, ciprofloxacin, erythromycin, erythromycin and polytrim, some prednisone here at one point. And then we got some azithromycin. I'm not going to read the list to you. Here's some antivirals. Here's some erythromycin. Here's an allergy med. Joe, do you think they probably should have cultured this or at least PCR? <laughs> and so mom tells me, then he has this severe reaction to ofloxacin, like, like, like heart pounding out. It's like they said, she said it was eye drops. So I said, all right. So we got the PCR test. You know, the right eye only grew Pseudomonas aeruginosa at 2 million copies, which is not too bad. It's still kind of in that moderate range. But the left eye is what really solved it for this patient. He's got Pseudomonas in both eyes. This one only has 93,000 copies. He's got the propion and bacterium. Again, that's a normal flora. To me, I'm finding but doing more and more of these when the eye gets stressed, that gets picked up. And he's got staph aureus. Now, take a look as we go down through here. Resistant, resistant, resistant. This is the Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Look at this. Resistant, 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 resistant. Little susceptible there. Some susceptibility here. Resistant, resistant, resistant. Look at this, resistant, 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 resistant. This is why they couldn't get this thing to clear up. And then you come over here to the other bacteria where there is re, where there's clear, clarity or where there's, no, where there's no resistance, then there's resistance in the other bacteria. So they suggested for this patient, look what they suggested right here. They're like, based upon all of this, here's the suggestion, fluoroquinolones. Uh-oh, look what they reported. <laughs> Severe reaction to fluoroquinolones. So now I'm out, of, I'm out of all options here. And what we did for this patient is I finally made some phone calls, found a doc down in Pittsburgh that's an infectious, uh, carrot, uh, infectious disease, called the mom, said, get coordinate with this doc, try and get in. I don't have the results yet. On October 14th, they're going to see and I'm going to re-talk to this doc again one more time. So this was a case where this poor child's been going on for two years, had all these, all these antibiotics, all these got pus pouring out of his eyes, a severe infection. Both eyes have pseudomonas. He needs to get to an infectious disease doc to figure out what's going on. And I'll stop there. And the next time I'll just finish up and do anterior case, more pearls, and we'll start here with the next lecture.